and sit down. Gentlemen, time to come and sit down, please. We have a treat for you this morning. We have a real treat for you this morning. And this is an Ignite talk. You know, you know that what happens, those of you that are familiar with the Global Maritime Forum will know that we have these Ignite talks to get ideas going from someone who is uh, not currently within the industry but has something really powerful potentially to say to help us start thinking in a different way when we go into our, into our, into our weeds, when we go into the details, when we start rolling up our sleeves and doing the work. <clears throat> so I'm uh, very pleased to say that today we have Mariana Mazzucato. She is Professor in the Economics of Innovation and Public Value at UCL. She's also Founding Director of the UCL Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. She's written three very acclaimed books, The Entrepreneurial State, Debunking Public versus Private Sector Myths, The Value of Everything, Making and Taking in the Global Economy, and just recently, Mission Economy, A Moonshot Guide to Changing Capitalism. And I've been following Mariana for, for quite a while, and I really think you're going to love what she has to say. We're going to have time for questions afterwards, so please be thinking about what you want to ask. And the big question to have in your heads before we start is, how can this amazing stuff that she's about to tell us about apply to what we are trying to do in the maritime industry and what we are trying to do here at the Global Maritime Forum? Marina, thanks very much. Thank you. I must say that when I was um, asked to come and speak at this conference, I was like, oh, another talk. And then I started reading about this sector, and it is so cool. It is actually, I think, <laughs> perfectly applicable to what I'm going to be talking about. But what I would love is if in the Q&A, you can tell me that. Like, how much of what you're trying to do actually requires a completely different framing, especially in terms of having a concrete and not what my kids would call waffly way to talk about collaboration, coordination, a purpose-driven uh, ecosystem, and especially, and this is the bit that got me really exciting, excited when I was reading the background, all these contracts you guys engage in, <laughs> it seems like a perfect opportunity for rent-seeking. How can we actually turn these contracts into really ambitious ones that truly have a common purpose at the center? And what I'm going to do is give you a bit of insights from a, this recent book I just wrote, which is, you know, we talk about these great things like getting the plastic out of the ocean, having carbon neutral cities, having a zero digital divide and so on. What does it mean to actually create moonshots and like really inspirational goals around those challenges and then bring together different types of public actors, different types of private actors, sometimes, in some cases, philanthropies, but also civil associations, and to work together really ambitiously and concretely to achieve that goal. What's actually required, like the one-liner would be, how do you bring purpose at the center of the ecosystem instead of, at best, a kind of you know, corporate social responsibility gimmick? Um, and the context, of course, given the announcement we just had on COVID and this poor chap who has tested positive, um, is one where I think globally we have just realized how badly we, you know, prepared we are for some pretty basic things. Of course, COVID is not basic, it's complicated. However, some pretty basic things that had to be done early on, like getting personal protection equipment <laughs> to frontline workers, is easier than going to the moon and back. And yet we failed miserably. We also failed quite badly and still in many parts of the world, failing in terms of the test and trace system, you know, kind of the digital governance also around that. And we're completely failing to deliver the vaccine globally. It's a global pandemic. It makes no sense for 80% of the doses to be hoarded by 10% of the countries, right? So these challenges, and unfortunately, I'm sure you know, um, that, you know, there will be other viruses as the permafrost melts. Apparently, lots of viruses are going to come out. So these challenges, as they come to us, whether it's a financial crisis, a health crisis, a climate crisis, <laughs> because, of course, these are multiple crises, what does it mean to actually confront them together, globally, but concretely and also urgently? I mean, you know, these statistics from the IPCC report that we only have like eight years left until climate change is completely irreversible, you would hope that this urgency 
was really kind of on the front of what we're feeling at places like the G20, COP26, which is starting this week. And yet, you know, Greta Thornburg, when she was 16, now she's 18, she said, you know, what do you do when your house is on fire? Do you sit there and say, hmm, should I stay? Should I go? Let me think, what should I bring with me? You get the hell out and you get out quick. And we're not moving at pace. So one of the things is how do you move both quickly, right? Because you can't just sit there and again, waffle about it, but also with really like long-term thinking and planning, but planning together with ideas of again, common purpose at the center and making it, you know, um, how do you say, have an investment in innovation trajectory and plan on how to work together. And I think there is something interesting about what's happening in the corporate community. There's this business roundtable, which, you know, when was it? About two years ago, I'm forgetting dates now because COVID has made everything kind of a fuzz. I think it was two years ago, put out this letter in the New York Times saying we are failing inside the corporate community. We don't have kind of a long-term vision. We've just been maximizing shares and so on. What does it mean to actually maximize stakeholder value? And if you've ever been in places like Davos at the World Economic Forum, all the sessions are about that, right? Stakeholder value, bringing together different stakeholders and just think in your industry, how many different stakeholders there are with this notion of purpose. But to be honest, this isn't happening. You know, if you look at, again, what's happened even in, in recent years with say share buyback, something like $4 trillion have been spent by large corporates just in buying back their own shares to boost stock prices, stock options, and executive pay, which is often linked to stock options. So that need for kind of reinvestment of profits to land in the real economy and especially to steer our real economy in ways that produce a more inclusive and sustainable type of growth. Unfortunately, this isn't happening again at pace. And even though we have ESG kind of metrics, which are very important, what does it mean again to bring that notion of sustainability and inclusive growth at the center of how we actually work together on very clear goals? And one of the things I've been arguing is that governments are completely lost in this process. You know, at worst, we talk about government get out of the way, but at best, we think about the role of government in terms of fixing different types of market failures. This is the economic speak. Economists think that the market is out there, sometimes it screws up, and you need government to come in and fix it, whether it's by funding really important things like basic R&D. That's, by the way, why I sound American, but I promise I'm Italian. We left Italy when I was five to go to Princeton, New Jersey, because my dad's research, basic research around nuclear fusion, is funded by the U.S. Department of Energy, and lots of different types of government funding exists for kind of, you know, big science. So that's a typical market failure. Government comes in and does that or the opposite, when you have negative externalities, government might come in and do a carbon tax. And we'd hope they would do that, sometimes they don't, but still, this idea that you come in and patch the system, maybe with SME financing, another type of a market failure is due to the information asymmetries out there that mean that small companies sometimes don't get the loans they need. So this idea that you know, either government is a basket case and not useful, or at best is needed to come in and patch the system, is what I think has been really problematic. It's also problematic because if that's what you're doing, what are the capabilities you need to do that? They're not really dynamic. If instead it's about co-creating and co-shaping markets between business, government, foundations, like the ones that, that's putting on this uh, conference today, that's a different set of skills, right? Co-shaping, co-creating is not the same thing as fixing. So I'm sure a lot of you, you know, probably have complaints about your own governments, bureaucratic, inertial, you know, basket case, whatever. Well, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more we just think about government at best coming in last minute or fearing that something might happen to do something, that's not the kind of creative bureaucracy that one needs in order to tilt the system towards ambitious goals. So I got quite excited when I started to read about the moon landing because I kept thinking, how can it be that we're just failing miserably on earth on so many uh, levels. And yet 51 years ago, you know, they did something extremely hard. And by they, I mean business, many, many businesses were involved and government. And I just thought what actually happened, like literally at the organizational level and at the ecosystem level in terms of coordination, collaboration, literally the conversations in the room, what did they sound like given that I'm often bored <laughs> in rooms where I hear the sounds of how government and business talk to each other. 
And first of all, you know, what was so interesting in Kennedy's early speeches is he said things like, we're going to do this because it's hard, not because it's easy, right? And yet all the words I hear in kind of government departments, but also by businesses when they talk to governments, are words like make things easier, facilitate. How many Italians are in the room? Italians have great shit. Okay. Hello. Facilitare, no? Facile. So facilitating, Latin and Italian, means easy. So he said, we're going to do this because it's hard, and we're going to do it together, and we're probably going to fail along the way, and it's going to cost a shitload of money. Sorry, we're allowed to swear, right? You said Chatham House Rules. But it's okay, because it's worth it, right? Uh, but that thing about we're going to do it because it's hard, and it's going to be risky, but we're going to take those risks on together. We'll basically have to also welcome the underlying uncertainty. It's completely different from how public and private talk to each other. And the thing is, to be honest, they had no, no clue how to get to the moon in the beginning. They finally decided on this third way, the lunar orbit rendezvous, but the level of experimentation and willingness to experiment and willingness, to be honest, to do trial and error and error and error, something that any venture capitalists in the room? Good. Um, anyway, um, so venture capitalists brag all the time about the risk taking and, and they'll tell you, like Kleiner Perkins, one of the biggest uh, VC companies, when they succeeded in investing in Genentech, one of the top uh, biotech companies in the world, they'll admit that that success also required kind of eight or nine failures. Anytime a civil servant <laughs> fails, bang, front page of the Daily Mail. But the level of experimentation, but also learning from failure was interesting, you know, right? So the Apollo 1 uh, program ended in this tragic fire that killed three astronauts. And one of the astronauts on the day he died, before dying, he said, how the hell are we going to get to the moon if we can't even talk between two or three buildings? Because he couldn't hear what was being said to him by the mission control room. And on the back of that tragic fire, NASA brought in this guy, George Mueller, from Bell Labs, and they changed their structure, right? So again, think about your own sector, thinking about purpose. What does it mean to change how your organizations work and the sector works to be less siloed? to work actually between departments and to communicate. So what this guy George Mueller did from Bell Labs, he said what you actually need is proper delegation, project managers, really dynamic teams, but critically speak between the teams. Stop working within your little silos. And again, this is what I hear all the time, UK government, Italian government, each you know, department is working within its silo, but also in large companies, each department is working within its silo. What does it mean to have a purpose-driven organizational structure if we actually care about things like getting to the moon and back in one generation. What was also so interesting, and again, when I was looking at the background of your sector, just how many different kind of actors and in some ways subsectors there are, that to get to the moon, it required huge amounts of collaboration between sectors. It was not just aerospace at all. It required investment and innovation in sectors like nutrition, electronics, um, materials, software. I don't know if you've seen the film uh, Hidden Figures. It's wonderful about African-American women actually at the heart of a lot of the data and software revolution. And in some ways, software itself, as we know it today, was an outcome of the moon landing. But that kind of cross-sectoral spillovers that happened and all these kind of things that we think, you know, are just coming down from the sky, but ca you know, camera phones, foil blankets, home installation, and so on, were solutions to the homework problems that were required to get there. My earlier book, uh, Entrepreneurial State, was all about the iPhone and how, you know, if you don't like what I'm telling you about the state, then throw out your iPhone because everything in your phone, internet, touchscreen, Siri, um, GPS, all of those were innovations that actually came out of purpose-driven uh, public institutions like DARPA with the internet. And what's so interesting is DARPA didn't say, oh, we need the internet. They said, we need the satellites to communicate. Or GPS, basically funded by the Navy. The Navy never said, we need GPS. They needed to know where the ships were in the oceans. GPS, a solution. So a lot of these examples, but also in, in, in modern times, of some of the greatest technologies that we have, have been actually outcomes of purpose-driven innovation. So instead of obsessing about quantum computing and driverless cars, what are the problems that we have, which then require these technological changes to come about? There's lots of lessons on how to structure that ecosystem. The other super interesting thing with NASA is, yes, they had to collaborate. 
as I just said, across all these different sectors. But they didn't just talk about it, you know, at dinner parties. Oh, let's collaborate, public-private partnerships. They knew that partnerships, just like anyone here who is in a marriage or any sort of partnership, sometimes these are not good partnerships. They can even be abusive, right? So what kind of partnership do we want? How do you measure a symbiotic, mutualistic partnership? And the first thing they did was they said, we have the wrong contracts. And again, I'm fascinated by all the contracts in your sector. They changed the contracting. They realized that the, um, what was called cost plus contracting just wasn't leading to any kind of real innovation in, in the area. And they said, we need more like a prize scheme. So they had this fixed price contract that then had constant incentives for innovation and quality improvement in terms of actually how to foster this kind of dynamic, innovation-driven public-private partnership. They also put in the clauses of the contracts this super interesting thing called no excess profits. In other words, if we're gonna share in the risks and the uncertainty and co-invest, what does it actually mean to share, right? And by sharing, in other words, let's not turn this into a gambling casino. And I would argue actually that what we have today in the health sector, and I've looked a lot at the pharmaceutical industry and life sciences, is actually a bit of a gambling casino. <laughs> if you look at the billions that are even being made right now on the back of the vaccine, vaccines, huge amounts of public funding go into medical research. In the US alone, 40 billion a year, $40 billion a year go into health innovation in the United States through the National Institutes of Health. That's taxpayer funded. And somehow the prices of the drugs don't reflect that. The structure of the intellectual property rights don't reflect that. Um, and by the way, the US government even has legally the ability to affect it, but they're just too scared because of the narrative. And we were talking about narratives and stories before, the narrative of where wealth comes from. And in this era where they did something so cool and hard, getting to the moon and back, remember it was and back, can't just stay there, in one generation, they cared about actually structuring these contracts in such a way that that collective value creation was in fact reflected in how they worked together. Um, where's my time? Oh, plenty of time, five more minutes. Um, and so the idea of, you know, given that we have challenges on earth today, all this talk about inclusive, sustainable growth, but also since 2015, these really ambitious sustainable development goals, what does it mean to just pause and say, why are we not getting there? You know, these 17 goals are there, they're plastered on a contract, every country has signed up to them, but my view is we haven't turned them into missions. They've just remained there as broad challenges. So had the space race just remained the space race, beat the Russians, Sputnik, and had they not turned it into a bold mission, getting to the moon and back in one generation, they wouldn't have done anything. And I think that these goals right now, the problem is that they have remained just very broad challenges. We haven't turned them into these moonshots. So what I've been doing now for about three years is I've been trying to work very closely with policymakers and businesses and say, what does it mean to turn a goal into a moonshot? And you know, what's really cool as an academic, usually you, you know, write papers and at the end you say, here's my policy conclusions. Well, this work that I've been doing actually has turned into a new instrument in the European Commission around a missions instrument for its Horizon uh, program. It's a 100 billion euro budget of which a chunk of it now is dedicated to these mission areas around clean growth, um, uh, healthy cities, cancer, and so on. There's five of them. But what's the idea? The idea is you begin with the challenge, turn it into a mission, but the key thing is get lots of different sectors involved. Don't go back to the old way of thinking about innovation and industrial strategy where you just kind of hand out money to say an existing sector without actually asking for what? What are we trying to do together? And here, design the grants, the loans, the procurement, the bailouts, the recovery plans. I don't know if you saw that first slide, but something like 56% of COVID-19 recovery money has gone to fossil fuel driven projects. So use your tools, the levers that government has at the face of public and private to really crowd in all those multiple kind of, you know, types of experimentations and spillovers and projects um, at the kind of ground up level. So whether it's clean oceans or climate change, again, turning them into very concrete goals like a plastic free ocean reduction of 90% of plastic entering, obviously that's gonna require lots of different sectors from marine, AI, design, biotech, waste. But again, 
the kind of bottom-up projects that are required. This is very different from having a sector-specific approach, or even an approach that kind of obsesses about particular types of firms, like SMEs. You know, what are you actually trying to do? How do you crowd in and pick the willing, as opposed to pick the winners around goals? Um, and so what is a mission? First of all, it has to be bold and inspirational, otherwise it doesn't catalyze that kind of action. You know, going to the moon and back was quite inspirational. Um, and I personally have found it so interesting how so many kids know about the Plastic Free Ocean mission because actually there was, you know, the artists have sort of gotten involved in that, right? Attenborough's wonderful uh, Blue Planet um, documentary, that last episode on all these you know, dolphins and et cetera, choking on, on plastic. It's really galvanized thinking amongst the youth, just like the moon landing did where a lot of um, kids then, you know, went on to study science subjects because of the, or the janitor in NASA who said, I also am trying to get a man to the moon when he was asked what he was doing. So if it's not inspirational, it doesn't actually crowd in all these actors. Um, and a clear direction, you know, again, stop waffling. What are we actually trying to do and how can we measure our success, if over six, 12 months, 24 months, we're not even getting any closer to it, what does that mean? Ambitious, but also realistic, using also existing capacity, but pushing the kind of frontier within different sectors, especially with different types of conditionalities that require transformation and innovation in order to receive different types of subsidies. But especially this kind of cross-sectoral and interdisciplinary aspect. Again, getting to the moon, not just aerospace, nutrition, electronics, materials, software, and, and so forth. So getting lots of different sectors together to work towards a plan. Um, and also that kind of need to design those bottom-up, um, well, to redesign the instruments in order to galvanize that bottom-up uh, uh, approach. And I also worked very closely with the UK's industrial strategy, which used to be just this random list of sectors. It was automobiles, um, aeronautics, life sciences, finance, and the creative sector. I was like, to do what? And why are many other sectors, like your own, not in that, right? And so I, I worked with Greg Clark, who was in the um, previous government, to transform the industrial strategy around these four challenges, and then worked with the challenge departments, which they set up, to organize missions around them. So this was the future of mobility one, which again, involves your sector, of course, and the idea of, no, that's so small, you can't see it. It says, by 2040, to put the UK at the forefront of safe, sustainable, universally accessible travel, creating congestion and admission-free zero accident systems. It's a mouthful. <laughs> it's not as inspirational as going to the moon and back, but we worked with the, uh, with the challenge um, areas and, and the bays department, business, environment, industrial strategy. But what was interesting was that even just putting that word universally accessible travel meant that some of these bottom-up innovations had to happen in the world of disabilities, right? So instead of just saying, oh, we need to you know, fund areas of disabilities, why? Because you have a mission about making your public transport system 100% accessible. Worked also very closely with different public funds in the world, like the European Investment Bank. What does it mean to be a climate bank, which is what they talk about? What does it mean for your portfolio? What does it mean for that kind of risks and rewards? Um, and what does it mean to take risks in a public way? Uh, how do you even define risks? But especially, how do you make sure that the EIB financing catalyzes uh, crowds in other forms of finance. Also because in the end, these budgets that we have are not infinite, so that multiplier effect, which the NASA moon landing had in terms of all those spillovers, is key. In economics, we would call it additionality. How do you make sure that what you do actually galvanizes investment in other parts of the economy that otherwise wouldn't have happened, as opposed to what we often see, which is just handouts and so on. In, in Sweden, what's been interesting is that they began with a very high-level mission, which was a carbon-free welfare state, and then they landed it on really particular areas like school meals. School meals in Sweden today have to be healthy, tasty, not just IKEA meatballs, and sustainable. And they've gotten kids involved also through the curriculum. So again, that kind of inspiration and kind of interdisciplinary but it's clear, they have to be healthy tasting, sustainable school meals, which then has affected, again, their, the way they procure in, through the whole supply chain, the private sector to, del to deliver on that very ambitious goal. Um, I, again, this is more for the conversation, but I was just looking at some of the literature in terms of how you're trying to decarbonize shipping. And I think what would be interesting is to apply some of this kind of mission mapping to the sector. And, you know, this is just me 
playing around. But I think what's especially interesting is what does it actually mean in terms of new processes, new contracts, looking at existing contracts, which to me seem very bilateral. And again, opportunities for kind of, you know, dodging the, the, the common missions themselves, actually bringing together the design of the contracts, the design of the collaborations, the need for ambitious innovation-led regulation that actually helps steer and tilt the playing field in the right direction. Um, but you know, what is the list of kind of different things that have to happen, but especially being quite clear on where the bottlenecks have been, because I'm sure that there's no lack of talking about a sustainable kind of green maritime industry, why is it not happening? Um, and again, you know, what might actually have to happen in terms of producing kind of a new social contract, perhaps, between the different stakeholders. I've been quite inspired by what's happening in France recently, where the COVID-19 recovery funds have been conditional on companies like Air France and Renault agreeing to reduce their carbon emissions in the next five years. Whereas here in the UK, we just gave EasyJet 600 millions uh, in, in a no conditional, uh, you know, kind of recovery uh, loan during the um, COVID uh, uh, period. In Italy, you know, we tend to give out subsidies and guarantees without that kind of conditionality of building back better together between public and private. And given that we have that word out there, stakeholder value, we have words around build back better or build forwards better, what does it mean to bring this really ambitious notion of stakeholder value to the center of how you co-create value how you collaborate, how you coordinate, but also how you share between all the different stakeholders, the value that's created. And, and again, everything I read about your sector seems like you're starving for this kind of new type of framing. So uh, congratulations for at least having a conference like this where you're talking about it. Thank you. Mariana, thank you so much. I told you you were in for a treat mm -hmm. and I could already hear some resonances in what you were saying from what we heard yesterday and what's going to come up today. Um, so I just, uh, we have a couple of moments for questions. So does anyone want to make any question or comment right here? Microphone here, please. Can we have the lights up, please? Hi. Thank you. Um, thank you for that. Uh just fangirl out for a minute and tell you that I've been, uh, you've influenced quite a lot of our master's studies in international business and politics and redefined PPPs. I've read every one of your books. You're one of my heroes. <laughs> Come on stage. <laughs> yeah, just uh, start with that. I was so excited. Great job, GMF. Um, so I'll start with that. Uh, also, yesterday, we, you'd probably be happy to know that we have a mission innovation approach yeah. from the US, Denmark, and Norway right now on uh, focusing on shipping, which is great. There was a lot of kickback, I think, or at least in the sessions that I attended on, um, I think one is setting the targets, how to you know, set and frame the agenda in the absence of political entities. So we're yeah. a very global industry, you know, not, a, not a corner of the world isn't touched by shipping. And as a result, it's also a non-jurisdictional industry with a lack of regulation and regulatory body you know, mm. coordination. So maybe some advice to the sector as to how we as the industry, which is generally what a lot of our conversations are revolving around now, bottom up industry kind of coordination in the absence of regulation and how we can just start on the journey of even setting the, yeah. the right targets. It's Thanks. incredible that, you, that there isn't that kind mm. of international body. And, and to be honest, there is nothing like that also in space today. You know, the International Maritime Organization. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, right, yeah. They set the you know, regulations yeah. and then the enforcement's yeah. all national. So exactly. But if you look at what's happening in space today, just coming back to the moon landing, it's not what used to happen. There's no kind of proper regulation coordination. It's full of debris, like literally garbage. So these astronauts are like, we can't see anything. You know, similar to like Uber bikes being like anywhere on the sidewalks and you know, disabled people not being able to cross. So there's something about in this economy right, public, private, third sector actors, um, it's gonna be impossible actually. I mean, I would say it's gonna be impossible to actually coordinate around a purpose-driven goal without that. So I guess the first question back to the, the sector, how can you actually reflect on that and set up the kind of IMO, if that's not the right one, that you need also in order to create kind of a certain landscape, like what are the rules of the game? I mean, my experience with industry is often they're saying, yeah, but you know, when, when I talk about share buybacks and $4 trillion having been spent on that, that's allowed. 
You know, I mean, it used to actually not be allowed. The SEC actually got kind of got conned into deregulating that. So it's not their fault if they're doing that. Um, the whole taxation system currently is rewarding short-termism. We have a capital gains tax structure that rewards short-termism. So the question is, how can you actually get proper rules that are not just telling people what not to do, right, the bad, but also how to do the good together? And it does seem that that maybe is one of the biggest bottlenecks that you have in the sector. And so really focusing on that to make sure that then the great ambition that you might have in the sectors, but also, you know, the different actors has a, a I don't like the word level playing field, but at least a playing field. I wouldn't say level. I like the word tilting because we need to reward those actors that are moving in the right direction. But still, what is the playing field? And it seems very uncertain and open to a lot of gaming because of all this bilateralness. So, so, actually, yeah. so that, and that rhymes, because yesterday we talked quite a bit about how the, how the sector can engage with governments and how the sector can also encourage governments to engage with each other, because there are some governments that are doing this a lot better than others. Yeah. And so one of the things that we're already looking at is what the, what the action from that might be for this organization to try and engage with governments and help them to have better yeah. conversations about setting this. Um, but also the waste. I mean, it seems there's a lot of waste both in terms of you know, potential reduction of carbon emissions by actually having the coordination, but waste in terms of money being spent on these little contracts. Like the opportunity for rent seeking seems massive in this sector. Sure. And using, you know, taking away the rents, turning them into profits <laughs> that can be reinvested into these great areas. We, we just have a few minutes and we do have a hard cut off. And so just if you can make your comments quite short. Yeah, um, I think most of the people in this room are most closest to Ronald Reagan's famous nine words. <laughs> then the way you speak. But thank you. We realized yesterday when we talked about, you know, possible carbon tax, it's impossible to administer without setting the rules. So yeah. it's, your speech was very helpful. A quick question. You mentioned 65% of the money for COVID went to the uh, petroleum ministry. Uh, so okay. if I look at it, that Exxon and Shell and everyone else absconded with that money is kind of scandalous. If yeah. I look at it, that uh, the equipment involved, the jet fuel, the gasolines, the PPE is all petroleum based then I would say they added to the help solve yes. the problem. So which is it, or somewhere in between? How does that number come without having a lot of publicity, the 65%? Yeah, so that was, um, was it 56%? 56, of, yeah, sorry. yeah, whatever. But of the COVID-19 recovery funds that went to energy projects were fossil fuel projects. But still, it's, it's, it's equally scandalous. I mean, no, I, I mean, like, was it for jet fuel that moved the products across the earth? Was it for the plastics and the PPE? What was the, what oh, was that? all sorts all sorts of different projects. I mean, as I just mentioned, you know, like, I mean, if, so that's global, first of all, that's amongst the G20 countries. But as I mentioned here, for example, huge bailout to EasyJet without any sort of conditionality attached to EasyJet reducing its carbon emissions. It was a lot of just trying to help particular companies or particular projects stay in place. And that's the problem. You shouldn't be giving out money for projects or companies to stay in place the status quo, it should be conditional on those sectors, every sector, to transform. In Germany, by the way, the um, loans recently given to the steel sector, and steel everywhere is having issues, um, instead of just giving them money like we did here, and in Italy, just gave out money to the steel sector, it was conditional on steel reducing its material content, which it had to do, not because it went to Davos, because it was conditional on the loan, which they did through repurpose, reuse, recycle technology through the whole value chain. And today they have one of the greenest steel sectors alongside Sweden and the world. Um, but that came about because they had to. And, and I think, you know, instead of seeing government as just a regulator or at best a redistributor, how to really see it as a kind of co-investor, right? Most, again, everything that's in here was invested by, are you American? Yeah, so America talks in a Jefferson way, but it actually acts in a Hamiltonian way, if you've seen Hamilton, the, the musical. So Hamilton was this great politician in US history who actually advocated for industrial strategy. The US has always had an industrial strategy. It's pretended not to. Um, but the question is, how can we actually talk about it more openly so that industrial strategy is, again, more purpose-driven? Most of fracking and shale gas in the US was government-financed initially. Now everyone's worried about it, but where are the discussions? Like you're saying, let's talk about it, you talk about storytelling, where are the discussions globally about how we should be spending this huge amounts of taxpayer money so we don't allow a lot of it to be not transparent, which is what you're basically you know, talking about, um, and have also get civil society and kids involved. I really think kids would be fascinated by your sector. Look at that toy. <laughs> <laughs> we, we are. We yeah. are out of time, I'm sorry to say. I'm sure we could speak about this all day, but I hope we can take 
what Mariana has been telling us into our conversations today. I'm going to pick out a couple of things before I allow you off the stage. Okay. No, no, don't leave. Oh. Come right here, because what I heard is, I heard this brilliant thing. I'm often bored by the sounds in the room when business and government are talking to each other. I love that, because I'm often bored by the <laughs> sounds of the room when I'm hearing business and government talking to each other. And we need to figure out how to make fresh conversations, and that's partly what we're going to be trying to do today. I also heard about the importance of learning from failure. That came up a lot yesterday. We had that mm -hmm. amazing quote that I mentioned last night, which is, we have to be ready to fail forwards. We have to be ready to fail forwards, and we have to be able to, to, um, to manage how we balance out the risks. Also, the need for innovation across sectors, involving other sectors, which came up a lot yesterday, and I think is going to come up a lot today as well. Um, so, I, and I thought also, I think, what kind of partnership do we need? How you share the risks and opportunities? Um, how you turn vague challenges into specific missions? And the final thing that I want to mention to all of you, and to, to say thank you to Mariana for bringing this lexicon into our, into our discussions is, we should be picking the willing, not the winners. We should be picking the willing, not the winners. So that means we have the opportunity with the willing to figure out what the eventual winners need to be instead of starting from the winners. So I think let's have that in our head when we carry on the conversations. I'll explain in a minute what's going to happen. We have, sadly, to say goodbye to Mariana for now, <laughs> but, I, but I, I, I certainly intend to engage in more conversations with her, and I'm sure that many of you will too. Thank you for bringing this energy and wisdom and vision into our conversations, and we'll look forward to continuing it later. Thanks very Thank much, you. Mariana.